welcome class. This is, again, is the North Shore Church of Christ. We're at 326 Julian Street, Waukegan, Illinois. I want, I'm very uh, thankful that you take the time out to, uh, in your, in these days of trauma in our nation, you take the time out to uh, participate with us in this class. I do want to say, I have an offering for you. We do have a 30-lesson Bible class that you can uh, enroll in. All you need to do is just call our office at 847-623-9727, and we will get you enrolled. There are 30 lessons that will take you all the way through the Bible because I believe that the people that listen to this class, they are interested in the greatest book in the world, that is the Biblos, the Bible. And that's what this class is all about. I think since this is a class, I want to share with you something that sometimes you have to be observant. And this helps you with your Bible study uh, on some things that's happening with our uh, government and, and just to help you to understand better. On, last, on yesterday, I noticed that uh, our president of the United States made a statement that uh, he was going to send out the military. And uh, he would send out thousands of troops and various equipment and artillery. And then he turns around and walks over to a local church. And in the process, he holds up the Bible. And when he held up the Bible, uh, now he's in my territory. Uh, when you hold up the Bible, you're bringing heaven to the table. You're bringing God, you're bringing Christ, and you're bringing the Holy Spirit. He held up the Bible uh, in this scenario. Let me just share, as we study, Jesus would never, would never call a secular military on his spiritual people. He just didn't function that way. As a matter of fact, to give you an example, Peter being, Peter was a bad dude, class. I want you to just think about the character of Peter. The Lord had to work with him. Peter, you know, he was a, he would cuss you out. He, he was a, he was a, he was a, he was really, he was really a street gang type guy. Uh, he was prejudiced. So racism was a problem. Peter had that. He couldn't stand Gentiles. Uh, on one occasion, Peter cut off a man's ear. And the Lord responded to him in Matthew chapter 26. You can just write this down and, and uh, it's, it's something that I'm just pulling off the the top of my head, but Matthew 26, and, and I believe it's right around verse 52, where when he did that, Jesus said, put up thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Now, that's, those are the words of Jesus. Now, since our beloved president picked up the Bible, now, I don't know what his intent was. I don't, I don't intend to know what his intent was. But when he picked up the Bible after saying that he was going to bring out the military, that is something that Christ would not do. He just would not bring out a secular, the only military around anyway at that time was the Roman soldiers. He wasn't going to call the Roman soldiers to fight his own people. And, and in the case of Peter, the Lord handled Peter by using the Bible or the word, he said, Peter, the devil desires to sift thee like wheat. He said, what you need to do is go and get yourself together and then come back and strengthen the brethren. So the Lord used comfortable counseling, words of comfort to straighten Peter out. He didn't say, I'm going to call the military. He told Peter, put up your knife. We don't need a knife. Okay. And Christ never called a military. In fact, Christ, 
on one occasion, Christ indicated, I could call 10,000 legions of angels and, and, and whip all of you. He didn't even, he, he said, I would not do that. In fact, throughout all of his passion, the Savior never lifted a hand in a fighting mentality. He dropped on his knee to pray, and not drop on his knee to kill somebody. Ah, uh, now let's, I just thought I would share that with you to show you that what you see on television can lead you in a direction that maybe you may not want to go. And that's why, by listening to our program here in North Shore, we're going to try to give you the straight story from the Word of God. So when somebody brings up the Bible, that, 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 that means that we can, we, can, we, we can deal with that. Now, so, so when you bring up the Bible and you don't know what you're talking about, I suggest you get some advisors to counsel you and to encourage you in the Word before you use the Bible. It would be like uh, someone, they need the Constitution, but they bring up the Gettysburg Address. You know, you've got to have the right document for the right situation. Now, if you bring up the Bible, Christ never used the military. So I would assume that our president is going to do what Christ has done. He's going to begin, he's going to set up a conference table and call people in, black people, white people, uh, old people, young people, and sit down and talk and discuss what needs to be discussed for the betterment of the total nation, not just some in the nation. Christ dealt with all people, Jew, Gentile, bond, free, the poor, the ugly, the diseased, everybody. He dealt with all people and not just some. Now tonight, in this class, let's deal with something that I believe is prevalent uh, for all of us. I want to turn to 1 John. Let's go to the New Testament, 1 John. Now, John has, there's the gospel of John, and then there is, uh, they are the epistles of John. John wrote three epistles. It was 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. That's the appropriate uh, way to, 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 to say that. And in, in 1 John chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse number 11. Let me just read a few of these verses because that's, that's where we'll spend most of our time in this class. Uh, now, this class is dealing with the solution to fearfulness. Solution to fearfulness, just as we have here. Uh, I see, just at my low level of, of ob observation, that fear is setting in. People are afraid. You know, many times we do irrational things because we, we have fear. Let's talk about fear. But now, as we talk about fear, we want to talk about it from the perspective of our creator. See, I always like to go to the creator as my standard. See, you need a standard in life. Now, I realize there are, there, there are people who are well-trained Psychologically, the psychiatrists, or, you know, those who know psychology, et cetera, uh, who have who have a degree and have their PhD. But I go to the real PhD, that's Christ Himself, and let Him help us with this thing of fear. Now, you notice that in our classes now, we've dealt with anxiety, we've dealt with care or worry, uh, we've dealt with loneliness, we've dealt with hopelessness, we've dealt with suffering. In this class, we want to deal with fearfulness. Uh, fear has been prevalent since the beginning of time. Now, in 1 John chapter 4, uh, let me just open up a few verses here in verse number 11. Uh, Let's see, 1 John chapter 4, verses 11 uh, down through 18. I'm not going to read all of that, but let me look at verses 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. 
if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us, or it's completed, or it's matured in us. Uh, to save some time, I because I I'm going to come back to some of that, I want to drop down to uh, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness, boldness. See, when, 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 you're, when you're fearful, you're not bold. But, but he's saying, John is saying now, herein our, lo our love is made, when our love is made complete, that agape love, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So in other words, Christ never demonstrated fear. Even when they beat him and bruised him, he never demonstrated fear because he was connected uh, to his father, the, the God of heaven, the omnipotent God, and he himself was God, the incarnate. Now look at verse 18. Now this is a verse you ought to in, in your Bible or in whatever you, you have, highlight this verse, verse 18. There is no fear in love. Now, make sure, you remember I brought that lesson on love on Sunday, uh, but make sure you get this love right now. This is, this, this is, not, uh, this is not street love, you know, erotic love. This is not brotherly love. This is, you know, this is not family love. This is agape or sacrificial love. This is the heavenly love that we talked about in that, and you might go and pick up that lesson and get that love. There is no fear in the heavenly love, but perfect love does what? It casts out fear because fear hath torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Th there's, there's a real answer right there. <laughs> One reason, this, this, this helps me now to help people that I come in contact with. One reason why we have the racial problem, we have the, the, the problem of wanting to be destructive or whatever uh, irrational behavior, it, it's, it's tied to fear. Because if we, if we had the right love, there is no fear because he that feareth is not made perfect in love. When, when, when you have fear, it affects your ability to have the sacrificial love. Christ, he had to have the agape love because he, 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 was, he wasn't concerned about himself. He was concerned about you and me and all of us. And we owe it back to him. That, that, that's why we have this class to help those who are listening to understand that you owe it back to Christ. Now, so this fear is prevalent <coughs> that we're talking about from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve, uh, when they disobeyed, this led to two things. Number one, separation. When you are separated from your creator, so you can be walking around alive and still separated from God. See, God doesn't look at death the way we look at death. Separation to the Lord is death. When you're separated, that when, when, you, when you rebel and disobey, that brings on separation and ultimately fear. All right, in the case of Adam and Eve, they became afraid. And the, the, now the Bible, let me, let me give you two words for fear. I, I, I jotted that down so you could see. There's two words for fear in the Bible. <clears throat> One word is philial, F-I-L-I-A-L, philial. That type of fear is, is a God-given fear. In other words, that's a fear that the, the presence of God, the presence of Christ brings on us. In other words, we are in awe of the, when, 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 when the Lord is around, we, our whole behavior changes uh, because we respect the Lord. That's the filial fear. That, that's a good fear. That's a therapeutic fear. See, th there's, there's a therapeutic fear, then there's a caustic fear. Uh, this fear is, is a God-given fear. When you reverence God's authority, see what what we've got to learn to do. It, it, it's not about the authority of the president of the United States. It's the authority of God. God's authority supersedes all other authority. We obey God's authority. 
And when you obey God's authority, you will shun or avoid evil. Uh, in fact, in Psalms 111, uh, this is back in the Old Testament. The psalmist wrote, I believe that's 111 Psalms, and let's pick up at verse 10. And we've probably heard this verse many times, so this another, is another good verse to kind of highlight uh, in, in, in your Bible. <coughs> Uh, let, let's, let's, let's deal with verse 9 first, and then we'll, we'll come right into verse 10. Now notice 111 to 9 says, He, that's God, sent redemption unto his people. Now this is the beautiful thing about it, because all of us need redemption. In the Old Testament, he sent redemption. The New Testament, he sent redemption. He hath commanded his covenant forever. See, we have the Old Covenant, and we have the New Covenant. Now, see, see we... What is commanded forever now is we're under the new covenant, okay? All right. Now, he commanded his covenant forever, holy and what? Reverend is his name. So that tells me that God who sent redemption, the God who commanded his covenant, he is reverend. That, that, ladies and gentlemen, I get, that's the reason why I, I, I'm not qualified to be referred to as reverend. I mean, I know it's a habit we all have and so forth, but when you look at the word of God, I, I'm not anywhere on the, I'm trying to get where God is. So I, I, I'm just not qualified to have that, that particular identification. He is reverend because he is awesome. He has authority uh, over heaven and over earth. Now look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. The fear of the Lord, because God is reverend, because he sent redemption, he has uh, a covenant, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, so when you get this filial fear, wisdom starts kicking in, okay? Wisdom, that's the heavenly wisdom. We talked about wisdom in one of our uh, previous discussions. It's the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments and his praise endureth forever. Now, I'll tell you one thing. In order, see, a lot of people praise the Lord, but they are just afraid. They are, they are, they are scared. They are shaken in that, with their lives. They are afraid to face tomorrow. And when you're like that, you need to check yourself and see where you are in your relationship with the Lord. Okay? So, in fact, when you get the right kind of filial fear, that's the beginning of wisdom. And also, it's the secret to happiness. Uh, j just turn over in the next book in Proverbs. Uh, the book of Proverbs written by Solomon. Uh, let's see, I believe that's chapter 8. You go to 8th chapter of Proverbs. Just want to give you time to uh, pull that up. The 8th chapter of Proverbs, and uh, I believe it's verse 13. <clears throat> look, look, look at what Solomon says. Solomon says, well, well look, again, to, to, get, to get the context, I, I like to read the verses before, then I come down to the verse that I really want. In verse number 11, it says, for wisdom is better than rubies. I, 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 like, I like that. See, wisdom is better than rubies. And all things and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. There's a whole lot of things we desire. But you know what you need? You need wisdom. Wisdom, 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 heavenly wisdom. Now look at verse. Now look at the next verse. Now, verse twelve. I wisdom dwell with prudence. I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty interventions. In other words, wisdom can help you to discern deceptiveness. Like when I opened up just a moment ago, I shared with you about our our, our beloved president pulling up the Bible in front of the church after talking about bringing out the military. Now, now, wisdom helps one to see the potential of deceptiveness, okay? And, and, and I'm not saying that, that he's deceptive, but I'm saying wisdom will help us to discern deception. You know, it might be in your own children. Wisdom will help you to pick up when they are deceptive or somebody that you work with is deceptive or when you go in the bank and the teller is deceptive. Wisdom will help you to begin to discern that. All right? 
So, so, so he goes on to say now, in verse 13, this is the verse I really want. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Now, this filial fear will cause you to hate evil. See, now, you don't hate people, but you hate evil. Now, now it's hard to separate the two. It, at least, oh, let, let me put it this way. It's hard for me to separate the two, but I have to work on that. I cannot hate the person that the Lord has created, but any evil they do, I have to deal with it. The Lord told Peter, the Lord didn't hate Peter. He said, Peter, the devil, Satan, desires to sift thee like wheat. The Lord was after Satan because Satan was after Peter. But the Lord loved Peter. As a matter of fact, the Lord loved Peter so much that he allowed Peter to preach the first sermon in the Church of Christ there on the day of Pentecost. You remember that when the church started operating on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2? Peter was the lead speaker along with the other apostles. Okay. Now, he says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride. Pride is a killer. See, that, that, that filial fear will help us to work on our pride. Arrogancy. Sometimes we get arrogant. Uh, that, that's, that's one reason why, you know, I, I'm, I'm prayerful that we're going to get some assistance down with the people that are in need. That, 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 see, when you get arrogant, you, you look down on people, all right? Arrogance and pride. But the fear of the Lord helps to deal with that stuff. And the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. See, when you have the fear of the Lord, you don't like uh, cussing or a crooked, deceptive words and, and mouths and evil ways. And then he says in verse 14, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding and I have strength. Okay, that's the filial fear. Now, there's another fear in the Bible. And this is the fear that impacts all of us. Write this down. It's a slavish fear. S-L-A-V-I-S-H. A slavish fear. Obviously, that's the natural consequence of sin. Uh, let, let, let me do something real quick. I, I know everybody, you know, has heard that word sin. Uh, sin, sin. Uh, we, we say sin. I mean, if I were to ask you what is sin, you might say, well, it's, it's doing wrong, okay? But... See, you got to have a standard of sin. The Lord gives you, Christ gives you a law to live by. When you disobey it, that's sin, okay? But then the, here's the real question is, why do you sin? Here's the reason why you sin. Because there is a satanic, that's Satan, intervention. See, Satan intervenes into your nature. You can't see that. See, when, when Satan gets into your nature, you act strange. When Satan got into Adam, he rebelled. When Satan got into Eve, she rebelled. When, when, Satan, when, when Satan got into Lot's wife, see, God said, don't look back at Sodom and Gomorrah. And she looked back. If you remember the story, she turned into a pillar of salt. Satan got into the heart of the prodigal son who asked for his inheritance. And he left, and then he wasted it all. Satan got into, David was a, a man after God's own heart. David is up on the housetop one day. He sees a woman bathing. And he sets up to have her to come to him for a sexual encounter. See, when Satan intervenes into our nature, it sets up the word sin. Okay, all right. So the slavish fear is the natural consequence of sin. And, and, and of course, another component is the expectation of judgment. In other words, when you sin, you, you, you know that you're going to be judged for that. Now, you don't know when it's going to happen, but you, it, it's just like when you did wrong growing up as a child. Your, your, your parents had rules for the household, and you violated the rules. You know, every now and then parents get wise, and they, they hold off the punishment and let you stew for a while because you don't know when the judgment is coming. But 
is going to come. And, 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 and that sets up a slavish fear. See, sin sets up. When, when you're speeding down the highway above the speed limit, you're not looking at the sights. You're looking to see where, the, where the, the state trooper is. A lot of you got devices in your car to try to pick up the state trooper. In other words, that's what we call slavish fear. You have a slavish fear. If you obey the law, you don't have to worry about where the state trooper is. But when you disobey, then you have a slavish fear because you know you're going to get caught. All righty? All right. So, so, so keep that thing in mind uh, just, to, just to give you an example. In, 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 we're still in, we're in Proverbs. Let, let's, let's look at Proverbs chapter 28. I love Solomon for these kind of discussions. In the 28th chapter of Proverbs, uh, verse 1. In Proverbs 28 and verse 1, look, look what Solomon says as he's guided by God. The wicked flee when no man pursues. In other words, when, when, when you have this slavish fear, you think somebody's out to get you. See, that there are a lot of people think that somebody is on their trail. And they think that because there's something going on in their lives that is not genuine. It's not honest. So the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are what? They are bold as a lion. Lord, have mercy. When you got your game together with the Lord, you're bold. But when you don't have your game together, you're looking behind your back. You're fleeing. That's the slavish fear. Okay, so... There's another example over in the New Testament. I'll just give you that scripture in Acts chapter 16, a guy named the Philippian jailer, the Philippian jailer. He was supposed to be the jailer. He's supposed to watch over Paul and Silas. They're in jail. They shouldn't have been in jail, but he's supposed to watch over Paul and Silas. And, and uh, because Paul and Silas are connected to Christ, Christ caused an earthquake and shook the jail. And all of the, 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 the jailers, were free. They could have walked out, but they, none of them walked out. And, the, and, and when the jailer, the Philippian jailer, found out that nobody had, he was afraid. You know why he was afraid? Because he had done wrong. He went to sleep. He, he, was, he, he didn't do his job like he should have done it, and he thought that everybody had left, or he knew if they, had, if they were gone, his head, he would be beheaded. He, would, he suffered the pain of the law. That's what we call a slavish fear. But Paul said, do thyself no harm. And then he taught him more perfectly the word of God. And in fact, the Bible said he was baptized. You see, when one gets the truth, when one hears the word, believe it and repent, confess and be baptized, then they're added to Christ. And then he became a New Testament Christian. And that, that's very important in his life. But when you, when you have that slavish sin, it will paralyze your life. We have people right now with this virus going around and their lives haven't been as they ought to be, as it ought to be. They have a slavish fear, a slavish fear. Okay, now let, let, let's, let's, let's spend a little time and then we'll bring this lesson to a close <clears throat> so you can have time to go back and go over it now. Let's talk about, I want to give you two, two, two points. Let's go back to our text in 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> In 1 John chapter 4, that's, that, that's, the, that's where our study is coming from. Uh, John, by the way, you know he was known as the apostle of love. And, uh, of course, we're dealing with fear, which is tied to love here. All right, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse uh, 18. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. Let's, let's look at that verse now. It says, there is no Filial fear in love. That's agape love. No filial, there, I'm, I'm sorry. There is no slavish fear. That's the slavish fear when you have the agape love. But mature, perfect, heavenly love casteth out that slavish fear because fear hath torment. And 
He that feareth is not made perfect in love. All right, let's, 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 let's work with that, that, that particular verse. Uh, let's start off and talk about the tyranny of fear. The tyranny. Uh, write that word down. T-Y-R-A-N-Y, tyranny, the tyranny of fear. Uh, when somebody is afraid, when they have fear, certain things appear relative to the body physically. Number one, you might have a furrowed brow. Uh, you might have a, a haggard facial expression, uh, staring eyes. Uh, you, you might have a trembling hand. Uh, some people sweat. Th their physical reactions uh, when, when one has uh, evidence of fear, the tyranny of fear. Now, there's a, there are some causes for the tyranny of fear. Let's, let's talk about the causes. And actually, <clears throat> there, 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 there are two causes. Uh, one cause for the tyranny of this, this uh, slavish fear is, let, let me just classify it as the ultimate, the ultimate cause. And the second one is the immediate cause. All right? There's the ultimate cause of the fear. All right, now, what's the ultimate cause? Well, you know what that is. Now, everybody in this class know what the ultimate is, and that's death. In fact, because you know every day that you live, death is somewhere on your path. That's the ultimate fear. You don't know where death is. But you know what's there. See, in fact, everybody that's in this class and that's taking this class right now, you are going to face death. You're going to face it. Uh, it is indispensable. Uh, in other words, you're going to have to face divine judgment. In Hebrews, let, let, let's, let, let's grab this verse, Hebrews Chapter 9, Paul writes in verse 27, I believe it is. Hebrews 9 uh, and verse number 27. Uh, if, 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 uh, let, 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 and, and you probably have read this many times, but, but look at it up on the screen there. You can see it uh, on your system if you're on the system. And as it is appointed unto men once to die. That's the ultimate cause of the tyranny of fear. We're going to die. And we're going to face judgment. See, now you may say, well, I don't want the class. I'm not going to I'm not gonna go to worship at North Shore Church of Christ. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like the Bible and so forth. But I tell you what, you're going to show up in, in the Lord's court. We all are going to show up. And we're going to be on time. We're going to meet our time, our date before the judge. Okay? So the ultimate cause is death. And we, now, we, we, we try to avoid that by we, we get on a good diet. Well, if, in fact, uh, our, 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 our producer of this class, uh, Brother Ison, he gets on a diet. Brother Brian Ice, his special diet there. Uh, one of our elders. I got another one of our elders. He's eating special. He's almost a vegetarian. Uh, he's just trying to, you know, eat good. You, you should eat good food, you know. But, but you, no, matter, no matter how good you are at eating good food and, and you're exercising, your lifestyle, and, and, and you, you, you know, what we do is we're trying to extend life. That's what we're trying to do. But even after all of that, you're still going to die. Okay. Now, you should continue to do that because at least you do, here's, here's, let me show you how Christ works. We have our part, and Christ has his part. Christ is going to do his part. We need to do our part. If he gives you a good body, you take care of that body. The more you take care of it, Christ feels good that you appreciate the blessing that he gave you. Yet and still, you have the ultimate cause 
of the tyranny of fear is death. Okay. Now, and, and, and certainly we're going to be judged. And, uh, and, and another reason why, because this fear involves torment. See, if, if, if my life hasn't been as it ought to be, and I haven't been honest, genuine, and I haven't been obedient to the word of the Lord, the children haven't obeyed their parents, fear, that, 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 that uh, slavish fear uh, sets up in me, okay? Now, that, that's the ultimate cause. Back in Genesis, <coughs> uh, let's go back to the, the first book of the Bible right quick, right quick. Uh, I, want, I want to give you that one. In Genesis chapter 18, <coughs> I believe it's the 18th chapter of Genesis, and uh, verse number 25, yeah, yeah, verse 25. Adam, uh, Abraham, Abraham is pleading for the Lord not to destroy Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, wicked cities, kind of like our cities now. We got wicked cities. What's, what's wicked about the city? The people in the city. When we live wicked, our city becomes wicked. When, when, we, live, when we live wicked in our homes, our homes are wicked. See, jobs are wicked. In the government, when people don't do right in the government, that's wicked, all right? So Abraham is pleading because God is getting ready to destroy. Look at in verse 23, Genesis 18, 23. Abraham drew near and said, will thou also destroy the righteous? You know, a lot of times people ask that question, you know. You, you mean God? You know, God is a loving God. You mean God will destroy the good folk with the bad folk? Yeah, yeah God will do that. Yeah, yeah, God, 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 see, God has the right to do that because, first of all, God created us all. So whatever God creates, he can destroy. However, he has given a rule, some rules of the road. If you go, abide by the rules of the road, he'll come to your rescue. Now, further, further in, 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 that, in that verse, let, let's finish it up now. He said, uh, so Abraham said in verse 24, peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50? In other words, what, what Abraham is saying, he's, he, now he's trying to negotiate with God. Lord, Lord, if I can find 50 righteous folk, will you still destroy it? All right, verse 25. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be God, that's just not like you to do that. You know what God did? God said, okay, 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 go ahead. You find 50, fine. I'll, I'll work with you on that. See, God knew that he was not going to find 50. When he couldn't find 50, he comes back and asks for 45. Same thing. He couldn't find 45. Save some time, got all the way down to 20. Verse 31, he couldn't find 20. Bottom line is God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. So, so, so the point here is that fear involves torment. Now, let's go to the other cause of the tyranny of fear. And that is the, what we call the immediate cause. The immediate cause. In order to work on that one for a moment, see, see there are certain things we do immediately and then, of course, there's what we're going to face ultimately. Now, let's, let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Go back to the very beginning book. Now, Genesis means beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, and verse number, let's see here, Genesis 3 and verse, let's look at verse 10. Uh, let's see here. Well, let, let's back up for context. Adam and Eve, they have sin, the natural, the consequence of sin, satanic intervention into their nature. Satan has messed with Eve, Eve messed with Adam, Adam, Adam has received the law from God, and Adam has disobeyed, and, 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 and of course, Eve has disobeyed. Now, in verse number <coughs> 8, the Bible says, and they, now this is Adam and Eve now, well, <laughs> I, I, I keep, let, let, let me back up to verse number 7 the whole story now. Since this is a class, we'll take this time for you to, to analyze this. 
And the eyes of them both were open. Now, when they sinned, their eyes were open. It's amazing what happens when, when you do wrong, your eyes are open. That man that placed that knee, his eyes are open. They're more open now than ever before because of his knee. All right. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the cool of the, of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees. You can't hide from God. But they tried. Like all of us, we, we try to hide. We try to, you know, tr try to be, uh, you know, esoteric or quiet or secretive. But you, 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 can't, you can't hide from God. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, can you hear God call Adam? Where art thou? Adam, Adam. That reminds me of my mother when I was growing up. You know, I'd be out playing. She'd say, Terry, Terry, it's time to come in. It's time to come home. You know, it's getting dark outside. I hate it. I hate it to hear that call. But the call came. I heard the voice in the garden. And then notice in verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Okay. Now. Let's look at the immediate cause of fear. Now, there are th three main reasons for the immediate cause. One is the sense of guilt. Let, 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 me, just, let me just squeeze this in up here on our board, <coughs> uh, just for, the, for your sake. One is guilt. I, I like to talk about guilt because this is a tool that's in God's toolkit. See, God doesn't have to worry about me or you when we do wrong. All he has to do is just, he, he, he can just, let me figuratively use it this way. He just turns up what, what I call the guilt button. He just turns up the guilt button and he'll bring you around to where you ought to be. See, guilt will make people eventually tell the truth. Guilt, many people who are incarcerated sitting there and haven't told the truth, but eventually I, I never forget the Browns chicken murder uh, in our area, in the Chicago area, for some of you who are maybe familiar with that. I think it was about nine years before they solved that problem, but eventually someone came out with it because God turned up the guilt button. They felt guilty. And of course, the whole case was, was solved. So the sense of guilt is the immediate cause of this slavish fear. See, when when, when we try to rationalize sin, guilt rises. Anytime I do wrong, I try to justify my doing wrong. If, 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 if I'm caught speeding, well, 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 officer, I was coming down a hill and the car went a little bit faster than I thought. I, I want to try to justify, in fact, the bottom line, I was speeding, okay? But we try to justify uh, our doing wrong. When, when we try to rationalize and that and guilt rises when we hide try to hide the evidence guilt rises uh, when we delay admitting guilt rises guilt rises and uh, in, 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 let, let, let's let's uh, if, if we can get one scripture I believe that's James chapter 2. Just flip that and maybe we can get that up on the screen too. I don't, James chapter 2 and verse 10 because I want to bring this class to a close so you can really absorb the lesson on your own. In, ja in the book of James, uh, and you remember James now is my special book of the New Testament. It's my, what I call my fix-it book. It, 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 it's a, do it yourself where you work on yourself. All right? James chapter 2 and verse 10. All right? Uh, James 2.10. Here's what it says. James says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law. Got that? You can, you can, you can be good about the whole law and offend in one point you're guilty of all. Now, let, let me give you a, a prime example of what I mean. Uh, when, when, when my son was growing up, if I, if I would tell him to uh, wash the car, clean the garage, 
and pick up the trash on the yard. Now, if he washes the car and picks up the trash, and then he comes in and says, I'm done, he's guilty of everything because he didn't complete my command. Everybody, you with me, class? Now, when, when, when Jesus says, let me give you another example. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If I believe in Christ and believe what he says, but don't be baptized, then I might as well not believe. I've got guilty of all, okay? What James is trying to tell us now about, God, about the concept of how Christ works, how God works is, that if I keep the whole law but I offend or I miss one point, I'm guilty of all. Now, and what's, what's hidden here is if I miss that one point intentionally. See, there's some things we do and we don't know that we have done it. That's where the Lord kicks in mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. See, every now and then, the, the, the state trooper, when you're speeding, will have some mercy on you. See, but, but, but when you willfully do something, you are guilty of the whole law. Okay, all right. So, so when, when, you, when you do that, uh, the guilt rises, okay? Now, another uh, cause of the, the immediate cause of this slavish fear is a lack of peace. Let me put this up here. P-E-A-C-E. -E. Peace is missing. When peace is missing, that sets up the, the immediate cause of fear. Let's, let, let's, let's get a passage of scripture for that. Let's go to Philippians. <clears throat> uh, Philippians, that, again, that's, that, again, that's a New Testament uh, uh, book. Uh, Paul is writing to the Christians, uh, to, the Lord, to the church, the church of Christ that is at Philippi. In Philippians chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7, let's look, let's look at that quickly. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. A lack of peace is another reason for the immediate call. All right, let's look at this here now. Be careful for nothing. In other words, what he's saying there is don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You got that? Now watch verse 7. And, which coordinates with verse 6, and the peace of God. Now, if you want some peace, you want the peace that God has to offer, which passes all understanding. See, God has a peace that we can't explain. In other words, if, if God is working with you, there, there can be a storm, a, a, a storm in your life. The Lord can keep you calm. He, you have something that you can tie into. When, when the children seem like they are out of control, the Lord can work with you and put you, keep you in control. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when he was in shipwreck in a storm and the ship was breaking up, he said, let's sit down and eat. Because Paul knew that the Lord was with them and of course everybody made it to where they were going and nobody was lost in the storm. All right. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall do what? Shall keep your hearts and minds how? Through Christ Jesus. Now, why in the world would Paul bring up Christ Jesus? Because Christ said in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children. So if you are a peacemaker, Christ will be the one that will deliver the peace of God. Now, if you are a troublemaker, Christ will not deliver the peace of God. So then what happens is God turns up the guilt button, all right? So that, that, that's another reason for uh, the, 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 the immediate cause of fear. And the third reason is, the third reason is, basically we've already gone through it, is you need Christ. 
the immediate cause of fear, look, look at these three causes. Number one is guilt. Number two is peace is missing. The peace of, of the Lord is missing, and you need Christ. Okay. When you don't have any one of these three, you got, you, 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 you got some misery in your life. You have the tyranny of fear working on you. Okay? All right. Now, so you, 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 need, you need Christ. Uh, there is a favorite phrase of Christ that he uses throughout uh, his writings and his, uh, his wording in the New Testament is fear not. Christ says, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. Let not your heart be troubled. Fear not, fear not, fear not. That, 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 that's important. That's a favorite phrase of the Savior. So the ultimate cause and immediate cause, these are all alleviated by Christ. Now, let's, let's wrap the lesson up now. Let's talk about the mastery of fear. Okay, let's, let's work on the mastery of fear. How do we master this slavish fear that sin brings on us? See, Christ is able to cast out fear and bring peace. Now, all right, now let's go back to our text of study in 1 John. Let's go back to 1 John. See, what I try to do is, what, what we try to do is we, we pick a lesson to study. We use that as our text, and then... We bring in other corroborating texts to help you to give more emphasis on the topic that we're talking about, okay? Now, let's, let's talk about the mastery of fear. I think there, there, there are three things that we need to highlight relative to the mastery of fear. Let me see if I can get those over here somewhere on this, on this board right quick. Uh, 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 number one, <clears throat> in order to master fear, uh, there must be a confession of Christ. You need to confess Christ. All right, in 1 John chapter 4, look at verse 15. Look at verse number 15. In verse number 15, it says, Whosoever, <clears throat> in verse number 15, it says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. God does what? Dwells in him and he in God. Y'all got that? So when you confess Christ, that sets up a relationship. Now look at verse, uh, that's verse 15. Back up to verse number uh, 14. We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. In other words, if you're going to be saved, don't, don't, don't try to deal with God. See, see, see when, let me share something with you about God. Though God is loving, though God is awesome, God can't stand sin. God will cut your head off. God killed 320,000 in one day. God allowed two million people to leave Egypt and only two made it to the promised land of the original group. Only two. Two out of two million. The two that was Joshua and Caleb. Moses didn't even make it to the promised land. God, though he's loving, he can be mean. Okay. So confession of Christ is so important. So we take the first step and then Christ will take the next step. Confession sets it up. In fact, Christ said, whosoever confess me before men, I will confess before my Father which is in heaven. So you've got to confess that you believe that I am the Son of God. When you do that, that starts the process of us building a relationship. Now, let's go to the, let's go to the second one now. The second one now is possession. Possession, possession, possession. You must be, there must be the possession of a Christ spirit. In other words, you must begin to develop a Christ-like spirit. I didn't say a Terry Atwater spirit. I said a Christ-like spirit. See, Christ has a spirit that is even killed, a spirit that is awesome, a spirit that is eternal, a spirit that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has a spirit that is edifying, a spirit that will lift, a spirit that will make you bold, a spirit 
that will help you to not be afraid when you are when you are afraid when you have the slavish fear he'll begin to work on that if you possess that Christ-like spirit all right now let's go back and look at our text now in first John chapter 4 see see it's all right here in the text see, a lot of time we read the Bible but you got to learn how to study the Bible all right in first John chapter 4 and verse 13 hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us why because he hath given us of his what? Spirit. And by the way, if you've got a real good Bible, that's a capital S spirit. So the spirit that Christ gives us is different than the spirits that we have. We, are, we all have many spirits going on in us. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. In verse 1 he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. That's a little s spirit. But try the spirits, little s spirit, whether they are of God, because there are many false spirits prophets are gone out. See, there are many people that look religious, look biblically based, but they're not. Just because one carries the Bible and holds it up in front of the church does not mean that it's Bible based, okay? So the spirit of Christ, you must possess that. Make Christ real in your life. How do I make him real in, in my life? Let, 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 let me give you another passage. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5 right quick. Galatians chapter 5, and uh, I, I have to give you this one because this will, this will help you to get the, the kind of spirit that you ought to have. All right? In Galatians 5, let's start at verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Let's, let, let, let's, let's see how we can build this thing up. But the fruit of the Spirit, now you see that capital S there. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. There it is, okay? This is how you get a Christ-like spirit. You got to have that heavenly love. You got to have that internal joy. And you got to have that God-given peace. That's, that's point one. Point two, you need to have long-suffering. You got to put up with some stuff. You, you, you can't just fly off the handle and get mad at somebody. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. See, in the United States, we've lost our gentleness. We've got everybody that's, that's harsh now and hostile. That's, that's, what, that's the problem with the police now. That's not all the policemen, but just the, see, one bad apple will rotten the whole barrel. It'll make them look bad. You know, one bad person in the, in the family makes the whole family look bad. You know, that, that, that's just that's a part of life, okay? All right. But, but we need to have long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Then there comes faith. All right. Now, what kind of faith is that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, the faith that we get from the Word of God. Then meekness, meekness, meek. Oh, Lord, that's another lesson all by itself, meekness. Meekness is where whatever power you have is under control. No such thing as I'm going to bring out thousands of military people to, to, to the people of the United States. So they don't need the military to solve this problem. Meekness is power under control. Temperance. That's where you got to learn how to be patient. Against such there is no law, okay? So that's the possession of a Christ spirit, all right? And finally, finally, so first you need the confession of Christ, the Son of God, then, then you need the possession of Christ-like spirit, and then number three, you need the expression. Uh, you need the expression of the ministry of Christ. Expression of the ministry of Christ. Let me help you to see that better. I heard somebody say, just as I was getting ready for this particular less class, I was listening to the radio, and uh, someone said uh, that we are, dim in fact, it was the president of the Mormon church said that we are denouncing Racism. That's what he said. I'm proud of him. He's denouncing racism.
Think about that for a moment. I want you to marinate on that. Denouncing racism. That's what he says. This is the big leader in that church. Denouncing racism. Now, how long have we been denouncing racism? I've heard many, many people in my life say, I'm not a racist. That's denouncing racism. Now, what about the other part of the statement? What are you going to do about it? So that's, that's where our problem is. It's good to talk it, but what are you going to do? Faith without what class? Works. It's what? Dead. Denouncing, I'm not a racist. That's good. That's good. I give you a C. I give you a C on that. Now, if you get an A, what are you going to do to make it happen? That's where the expression of the ministry of Christ comes into play. My confession of Christ establishes a relationship. My possession of the Spirit of Christ experiences, I experience his love. And my expression of the ministry of Christ is where I begin to enjoy his love and share it with others by doing something. I, 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 in fact, in fact, in, in, in 1 John 4, in, in, in our study lesson, our study as we close this out now, in 1 John 4, <clears throat> We'll go right back over there, and I, bl I believe it's verse number 18. <clears throat> Look at verse number 18, 1 John 4. Yeah, and, and verse number 18, it says, here, 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 and then right after this, I'm going to come up with 2 Timothy 1, 7. But now, first, right here it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, that's mature love, casteth out fear. It casts out that slavish fear and, and kicks in kicks in the filial fear. Cast out fear because fear has, that slavish fear has torment. There's the ultimate and there's the immediate problem. He that feareth, that have that slavish fear, is not made perfect in love. Now, let's, let's, let me leave you and I'm going to close the class right here with 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's call Paul back to the table now. In 2 Timothy chapter 1. And let's put that up there in, in verse number 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7. All right. It's the last verse, ladies and gentlemen. For God hath not given us the, what? Spirit. Notice something. It's a little S, a little S spirit. God, see, fear, that, that slavish fear is tied to the little S spirit, the spirit that's going on in us, the stuff that's going on in us. God doesn't give that to us. You know who gives that to us? Satan does. For God has not given us the spirit of slavish fear. Semicolon. Now watch this. What does God do? But what God does, he gives us power. What kind of power is that? Gospel power. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. He gives us gospel power. He gives us love. That's heavenly love. And a sound mind. In other words, make you have some sense. Act like you got some sense. You're rational. You're meek. And you are concerned about the other person and not about yourself. Then he goes on to verse number 8 and says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. This, this is Paul writing to Timothy. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. All right. I, 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 I cherish you being in this class on the solution to fearfulness. I pray that you will take it to heart and uh, certainly... Uh, don't forget to sign up for our 30 lesson Bible class here at North Shore Church of Christ. And as soon as things uh, unfold, we'll be giving you 
our service times and, and uh, so that you can come by and be with us if you would like. Then you may write to us and express your interest in the classes <coughs> and the things that we have been presenting to you to give you a biblical basis. We try to be silent where the Bible is silent and speak where the Bible speaks because the Bible is the constitution of the universe. It is the one book uh, that will tell us how to live, tell us how to die, and tell us about the hereafter. May God bless every last one of you. Let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for every day. We're thankful for the good things you do for us, even in our times of trauma, tribulation, and trials. You still are good. You cause the sun to shine, the rain to come, and the flowers to grow. Uh, you, you, you cause us to have relationships one with the other, though from time to time we are not as we ought to be, but you continue to shower your mercy upon us, mixed in with grace, so without the grace of Christ, we have no chance. We pray, Heavenly Father, you will bless us with that grace as we get that grace when we are baptized into you and become a part of your beloved uh, institution known as the Church of Christ. May we bless, may, you, may all be blessed under the sound of my voice until the next time that we meet. These blessings we ask in thy name. Amen.